Samantha, this is a wonderful book. I'm going to leave it to you to explain how the book came about, how you decided to write this, what were things going on, um, and let's start there for everybody. Sure. So my book is titled Hashtag Antisemitism Coming of Age During the Resurgence of Hate, and it focuses on Jewish Generation Zers, those born um, basically after 1997, um, up until our current demographic cohort of Gen Alpha, and how their identity has been shaped by rising anti-Semitism. I'm the first to say I am a reluctant expert on anti-Semitism. I don't think anyone who's not a, a historian wants to be well versed in this topic or good at this topic and I certainly am a lover of history but I'm not a historian. I came to this topic because I love Jewish teens. Um the people who invested in me when I was a Jewish adolescent are the ones who shaped me and set me up on a path for Jewish communal leadership and I wanted to be doing the same for others. So when I wrote my doctoral dissertation, I was focusing on teens who I'm sure all of us can kind of have someone who comes to mind they had some kind of congregational um, school experience um, in their kindergarten through B'nai Mitzvah years. They love being Jewish. They care about being Jewish, but they never showed up ever again. I wanted to talk to those teens and to understand because we know from research, being Jewish is positive for them. They love it. They enjoy being part of the Jewish people, I wanted to understand what the value add they saw Judaism as bringing to their lives is, and therefore to be able to make recommendations for the field of Jewish education about what could we be doing differently to get them back in the doors. Um, while I was doing the research, one of the questions that I asked all of the teens who I interviewed was what comes to mind when I say Jewish space? What is a Jewish space to you? And they gave every answer that I expected, whether it's synagogue or camp or my grandma's house or Israel. And I was nodding like, okay, I understand. And then I asked the follow-up question, do you feel comfortable in the Jewish spaces where you spend time? Because I wanted to understand is, again, there's something that we could be doing differently to welcome them, to make sure that they're whole selves were comfortable coming through the doors of the Jewish community, whether physically or in a metaphorical way. And I thought that we would be having a conversation about like these existential comfort levels. Are my politics welcome in Jewish spaces? Are my views on Israel part of the mainstream? Is my gender identity affirmed? And instead, the answers that I got were what I've come to refer to as heartbreakingly practical, because instead of these questions that I thought we'd be talking about, um, I got answers much more to the effect of, yes, yeah, Samantha, since the shooting at Congregation Tree of Life in Pittsburgh, there's always an armed guard outside of our synagogue. So I guess I feel comfortable there. Or the day schools in our community all got this government funding for bulletproof glass windows. So that's like, I don't know if I'm fully comfortable because for some reason we need government funding for bulletproof glass windows in Jewish spaces, but I guess it's better that it's there than if it weren't. And I started to realize how much the rise in anti-Semitism well before October 7th, and in particular, this real perceived threat of physical violence was impacting Jewish young people in terms of what it means for them to enter into a Jewish space, to show up Jewishly in public, to claim their Jewish identities. And that's ultimately what sent me down this rabbit hole of research that became the book and so much of the work that I'm privileged to be doing today. So let's let's go into explaining some of the terms that we've used. And I realize I've already used the term, but I didn't explain it. Can you describe who's the Gen Z generation Sure. So Generation Z is the demographic cohort born between 1997 and 2010. Um, this is the first generation of digital natives. People sometimes say it about millennials, but actually what's interesting about millennials is millennials behave in many ways like natives, but do have memories of getting a first computer before cell phones, before in-home internet, before any of these things. Gen Z is different from that. Their earliest memories are either of 9-11 or actually happened after 9-11. They have grown up in a world that, um, you know, in so many ways is, I mean, 
challenged to uh, to say the least. Their formative years have been shaped by gun violence, particularly the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting, as well as the 2018 st uh, shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida. They embody wanting to be and seeing themselves as activists. They're committed to climate change and recognizing, um, or not as it were, but have a lot of feelings about climate change and the climate change movement. Um, they have grown up in a politically polarized world in so many ways. They were transformed by COVID-19, whether it's as university students or as um, in first jobs, in first post-college experiences that they were right in the midst of, and some actually end of high school as well, as COVID was happening and as they were figuring out who am I as a person, all of a sudden this transformed into a fully digital world for them. And as Jews, for specifically Jewish Gen Zers, they have come of age in a space where they're living in multiple realities. On the one hand, particularly up until this past year, being Jewish has never been cooler. Like, you know, if for those of us who can remember a moment before October 7th, the number one trending movie on Netflix was You Are So Not Invited to My Bat Mitzvah. And I remember asking my husband, I was like, I know why I'm watching this because this is my job to understand what Jewish teens are into these days. I know why another Jewish person would be watching this, but who else is watching this? It can't just be us. And somehow this has mass appeal and that's really exciting um we are at a moment where being jewish again up until this past year has been seen as cool gen zers want to be unique they love anything that makes them different and really saw being part of the jewish minority as something different something that made them special something that they were able to claim and to own and to make their own in all of these different ways there's more opportunities to connect jewishly than there ever have been um, and to access Judaism both digitally and in person. And now we're at a moment where Jewish Gen Z is being shaped by anti-Semitism, is being shaped by the vulnerability that comes with being Jewish and being part of the Jewish people and the choices that they feel that they have to make as a result of the rise in anti-Semitism both before and after October 7th. Excellent. So the Gen Z me, generation would be today around the sixth grade to a couple of years after college, I think, right? So when when I did the research, they were. Um, right now, they are a bit older. I would say we'll, we're talking late high school, straight through um, to mid-20s. Um, and the current generation, that's uh, those younger grades, so elementary school, middle schoolers, and some early high school is what's now being referred to as Gen Alpha. Anyone uh, born in 20, 2010 um, till the present day is being called Gen Alpha. So everyone can place their kids and grandkids wherever they uh, wherever they make sense. All right, everybody, you got to remember that there'll be a test, Gen Alpha. How do these Jewish public school students uh, deal with anti-Semitism? Um, how do school administrations deal with it? And how do parents, synagogues, and community officials deal with anti-Semitism? What, what are examples of anti-Semitism that these kids are incurring? And what is the community that's there to protect them, to nurture them? How are they dealing with that and uh, reacting to that? Okay, a lot of questions. So anti-Semitism, as we all know, is manifesting in, unfortunately, many, many, many different ways, both pre and post October 7th, and I'm happy to speak to both. Um, I just want to start by naming actually what is anti-Semitism, because we've said it a lot of times. And for the purposes of this conversation, I'd like us to have a shared definition of it. Um, the definition that I operate based on in my work is the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance's 2016 definition. It's known as IRA for those who've encountered it in their communities. If this is not your favorite definition of anti-Semitism, by the way, totally fine. Um, but I'll tell you why it's mine. So the definition says, anti-Semitism is a certain perception of Jews, which may be expressed as hatred towards Jews. Rhetorical and physical manifestations of anti-Semitism are directed toward Jewish or non-Jewish individuals and or their property toward Jewish community institutions and religious facilities. And I'll put that into the chat as well, um, because I said a lot of jargony 
word. So again, this is IRA. Um, and in 2016, it was adopted in a non-legally binding definition, but is currently the basis for the Biden administration's um, work on anti-Semitism, the U.S. State Department's definition of anti-Semitism, and numerous state and local governments. Why is this definition important? Because I think it shows us the breadth of anti-Semitism in a couple of different ways. So first of all, we see where it says, may be expressed as hatred. We all know what to do. And even a, a student knows what at least they're supposed to do, whether or not they'll do it is a different conversation, when anti-Semitism manifests in a really classic way. Swastika drawn on locker of Jewish student, we know what that is. There's no ambiguity to this. And most places that we'll encounter have protocols set up for this type of event. You call the ADL, you report an instance of anti-Semitism, you reach out to your local JCRC, the um, the Jewish community will issue statements, the school itself will probably issue a statement saying something to the effect of hate has no home here and we know that we need to do something about this and we're going to have an assembly on tolerance or something to that effect. We know what to do in these cases and I'm only being slightly facetious. What we don't know what to do and what's hardest for so many of our young people is when they can't put their finger on was this hatred of Jews or was it just awkward or to use my most academic jargon was it just like icky um so what does that mean everything from um something that might be like a backhanded compliment that a Jewish student doesn't really know what to do with of where are you going on spring break you must have a lot of money not hatred of Jews. It is the use of an anti-Semitic trope to perpetuate a certain view of Jews. So we only have maybe expressed this hatred. We've had a lot of instances of um, the appropriation of Holocaust imagery within school environments. Um, there's a documented trend, particularly I would say middle school and early high schools where we're seeing this the most, um, of an interest in using the Nazi salute and have instances of schools where the question is called, is that really anti-Semitism? So I have one instance that's coming to mind for me of a um, school, public school, where a Jewish teacher reported this group of boys in my class uh, are using the Nazi salute and the response being, well, how do you know that's not how they raise their hands? Um, you can't really prove that that's anti-Semitism, even though in other classes they raise their hand in a regular fashion where there's not a Jewish teacher there. So pr presumably we could prove something, um, but there's these layers of what can really be documented and where are people hoping against hope, I would say, to not have to deal with instances of anti-Semitism. The other part of this definition that I really want to call everyone's attention to is where it says, um, directed toward Jewish or non-Jewish individuals. Jews, of course, are the primary recipients of anti-Semitism. But as anyone here um, who has been to, say, a rally in solidarity with Israel in the last year, or who has posted something about being Jewish online can say, as, lo as long as you're in that space, as long as you're posting, as long as you're showing up, whether or not you are Jewish, you risk anti-Semitism. So we know that when we have allies who do show up, they open themselves up to anti-Semitism as well. And the other part that I always want to name is, I don't know of a single Jewish communal institution, I don't know of pretty much a single Jewish family at this point, where all of the members self-identify as Jewish. And if God forbid anything happens in any of our synagogues, any of our schools, any of our communal institutions, um, the non-Jews who are in those spaces, whether it's as members of the congregation, as relatives of the congregation, or as employees, are just as susceptible to anti-Semitism. So how does that show up in schools? So a few, a few different things, some of which I've already said. Number one, it's happening socially. So what does that mean? It's friends. It's the friends who um, either didn't say something or did say something, who are posting about... Um, uh, Israel online in an anti-Semitic fashion, who are um, participating in walkouts, who from the youngest of ages are being taught or seen models for them 
anti-Semitic tropes that they then perpetuate. So what can that mean? I came of age again in this Jewish teen space as a professional. I never thought that the calls that I'd be getting about anti-Semitism would be from early childhood environments, from kindergartens, from nursery schools. But and I'm here, I'm based in New York. So if it's happening here, I promise it's happening everywhere. Um, I, I live in Westchester and I'm from Long Island. So, uh, you know, very much the, the center of these bubbles. Um, but had a call um, a few weeks ago from a mom of a four-year-old who said, uh, my kid was on a playground and another child said, you can't play with us because my mom said Santa doesn't come to your house. So that means you're bad. You must be a bad kid if Santa doesn't come to your house. That's four years old. That's, I mean, that's blatant anti-Semitism. That is literally saying, um, because Santa doesn't come to your house, because you are Jewish, um, I can't play with you. And we see that coming up in more you know, developmentally appropriate ways at every age and stage. We're seeing it inside and outside of the classroom, both as explicit bias and also as implicit bias. So an explicit bias instance is a teacher putting up a map that doesn't include, map of the world that doesn't include Israel on it and saying this is the only map that we're going to use in the school environment. We're seeing that happen all over the place. An implicit bias, um, a school district that I spent a lot of time working with this past year had truly in many ways, a really well-intentioned, probably wonderful for the kid for whom it was actually intended, um, family heritage project that they were doing with their fifth graders, where there's a whole template and it's your first big research project. And the whole premise is centered around, you um, find the country that your ancestors come from your grandparents, great grandparents, whatever immigrant generation um, you count back to, and then um, do all these different pieces of research about the flag of that country, the food of that country, the language of that country. And I then got called in to have a conversation about for an Ashkenazi Jewish kid, this doesn't make sense. This assignment to do it correctly doesn't work because I'll just say for myself, my family's from Poland, but if you told me to do a research project on the Polish flag, on Polish food, on the Polish national anthem, that is not the story of who I am and who most of us, many of us are. And the example then to give to the teacher is to say, they didn't actually come from Poland. They came from this place called Jewish. And the research that would actually be meaningful to this child is about Yiddish is about klezmer music, is about, um, you know, the growing up within the shtetl and emancipation and so many different layers of an Eastern European Jewish history that is incredibly rich. But the paradigm of this project is not designed for our story. Now, is that anti-Semitic and a blatant, I think that this teacher really designed this project to be exclusionary of the Jewish experience? Absolutely not. But in so many of these spaces, the ways that Jews have been discounted, that our stories are not part of what is considered um, need to be taken into account because there is a tremendous toll that it takes on a Jewish child, on a Jewish parent, and on a Jewish community to feel like the hackles are up all the time and there's a constant need to advocate and to show up. And in so many ways, the tropes of anti-Semitism almost prevent us from doing so because they have been um, weaponized in such an insidious way that for so many parents, their concern is essentially, if I advocate for my kid experiencing anti-Semitism, I'm doing what the anti-Semites think that um, I'm going to be doing. So what does that mean? I'm a Jewish parent. I'm upset about this question on a test or this assignment or the fact that my school child's school had assemblies about X, Y, and Z major world issues in the last year, but has not said a word about Israel. Um, or when they did say a word about Israel, they made it a both sides thing. And I'm upset about that. And by the way, I'm not here to comment on anyone's Israel politics. And you might have righteous upsetness about that. Great. Um, in any of those instances, the parent might very reasonably say, I'm really upset about this feeling of anti-Semitism or otherness or yuckiness, but I don't want to say anything because if I do go up and say something to the administration, I'm the loud, pushy Jew. 
And that's already what they think of me. Any other demographic group that wants to advocate for themselves doesn't necessarily have this hang up of, wait, the, the stereotype of me as a Jewish mom is that I'm going to be loud and pushy. If my child's in a private school environment, there's that stereotype that I have access to power and I have all this money and now I'm going to use it to threaten the school community to say, I'm going to pull my donation if you don't stop being anti-Semitic. Well, now I'm playing into anti-Semitism because they're going to think that I'm this rich Jew who has all of this power. So for the parents in particular, there's this real sense of, of course, my primary role is to advocate for my child to make sure that my child has a safe and well-rounded learning environment. But A, I need to be able to know enough to identify anti-Semitism where and when I and they see it. And then to have the confidence to say, I also need to overcome this internalized bias and this internalized anti-Semitism that makes me think that if I am loud in the ways that maybe my child really needs me to be, it's not going to backfire in some tremendous way. Related to that, we have a question from uh, Dale Levy. Uh, Anti-Semitism manifests itself differently, whether it be grade school, middle, high school, or college. So how do we, parents or grandparents, prepare our children at each level? When do we begin teaching our children? And how do we do that? Um, so my answers are not going to be um, happy, and uh, I apologize in advance. Um, whenever you, if you haven't started yet, today is the day to start. Um, if you already started, mazel. If it's already 8.30 for you and you don't have time to start today, tomorrow is the right time to have the conversation. One thing that we have learned as a society is that when there is a critical conversation to be had, we can no longer wait and have it as a big deal conversation one time. So an example of that, and I'm just going to say it out loud, we have learned we're not supposed, like, instead of having one day where you're going to sit your child down and have the sex talk, we know that that's not what happens anymore. You continually talk about bodies and consent and all of the different elements that come in. It's an ongoing conversation that's not one day we're going to sit down. There's not one day that you're going to sit down and say, we need to talk about how some people hate Jews or how some people don't like Jews or how some people are scared of Jews or whatever uh, language and euphemism is going to be the most comfortable for you. At the earliest ages, my personal belief, we start with Jewish pride. We start with Jewish joy. We start with normalizing that you are your full self and your full self is Jewish in addition to all of the other wonderful qualities that you have from these earliest ages and make it exciting to them to want to talk about it. Because one of the biggest things we're dealing with now is both silencing of Jewish selves, kids saying, like, I, I don't want to be different. I don't want to open myself up to this. I don't want to be other. Um, it's easier. I know I'm Jewish. I love being Jewish. We'll light the candles at home or we'll do whatever you were going to do at home. But I just want to be normal. We need to make being Jewish being normal. That's part A. Part B, we need to recognize and to teach anti-Semitism. So, I mean, for so many of us, particularly those of us who don't have children or grandchildren who are in day school environments, there's a huge, and I totally understand why I come from this world, scarcity mentality when it comes to their Jewish time. If I'm a religious school educator, I know that I have these kids for two hours a week. And somehow in those two hours, I need to fit in tefillah, whatever the latest chag is, b'nai mitzvah, prep, something with Hebrew. I'm also somehow responsible for these kids making friends with each other because we're all craving social emotional connection. So I need to spend some of that time building relationships and bonding. And because, I mean, and I'll, I'll just play into my own Jewish stereotypes here, because we are who we are, also somehow in those two hours, I need to provide snack time for some unknown reason. If I have two hours with a Jewish student over the course of a week, and I don't know if they're having any outside of that time infusions of Jewish joy into their lives, I don't want to be spending those two hours a week teaching them about anti-Semitic tropes, to talk about big noses and frizzy hair and loudness and devil horns and money and blood. Um, that's not what I want to spend my time doing because I want them to have a positive experience with Judaism. Of course, I want them to be having that positive experience with Judaism. And 
if we don't actually teach anti-Semitism and how and when to recognize it, our kids are left not realizing in so many instances, when have I experienced anti-Semitism? Again, we all know societally, we have check plus swastika drawn on synagogue, on Jewish kids locker. We know what that is. But I'll say if anyone here is from uh, Northeast Ohio, I don't know what region that would count as. Um, at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, I was living and working in the Cleveland Jewish community. The first positive case of COVID in the state of Ohio was the person who shared my office. I was in the first hundred cases. The first people to go into lockdown in COVID in the state of Ohio were the visible Jews. Why? Because what had we been doing that weekend? We had taken a busload of 50 high school kids to APAC Policy Conference in Washington, D.C., where we were part of the super spreader. So anyone else who got it then, like solidarity. Um, so what happens? This The only people who go into lockdown in this first day are active Jews from about a dozen different high schools in Northeast Ohio and the entire staff of the Jewish Federation building because we had gone to a meeting that morning before we realized what happened and essentially infected, sorry everyone, infected everybody. Um, this was before anyone else is in lockdown. They're like, nobody's home. So I'm in a WhatsApp group with these Jewish teens and they started to tell me how the kids in their high schools are calling COVID the Jew flu. And they thought this was really funny because it's Jew and it's flu and it rhymes and it's about us. And it, uh, you know, it's it's amusing. I mean, the first people to go into lockdown are the active visible Jews. This totally makes sense. And these poor children get me in their WhatsApp group saying, do you know what happened the last time that Jews were accused of bringing plague to a community? We could talk about like the Crusades and the Black Death and pogroms and um, all of these different layers. And now, do I think that the non-Jewish teens of Northeast Ohio were actually making an, uh, con an conscious connection to the plague by saying Jew flu? No, of course not. But in the same ways that we as a society have learned about institutionalized and systemic racism, we need to learn about institutionalized and systemic anti-Semitism. Because if these Jewish teens don't know that Jews and disease are a common anti-Semitic trope throughout history, they don't understand what just happened and that this counts. We're seeing it now with images, particularly um, coming as related to Israel and Israeli soldiers of bloodthirstiness, um, a lot of blood imagery, a lot of demonized, demonic soldier imagery, um, a lot of Jews as vermin, things that we've seen. We can I've, have the lesson plans of this is when this happened in, you know, 1930. And this is when this happened in 2024, these same images of Jews as vermin. So we need to be talking about it and teaching it. If the only conversations that a Jewish child is having about being Jewish are centered around anti-Semitism or their B'nai Mitzvah, however, then we're also not doing a good enough job because we want being Jewish to be a value add, to be a Jewish joy. We know that an identity based on defiance to another is not sustainable. To say to a young person, the reason you should be uh, proud to be Jewish and loud and proud about being Jewish is because other people don't like us, well, then great. Other people don't like us. I don't want to be part of this um, and I'm good to go. Um, there needs to be a why for them. So we need to start teaching younger. We need to start teaching in a way that is both encompassing of a Jewish story totally separate from anti-Semitism. So they have a why, but we need to teach the anti-Semitism as well, how to recognize it, what to do if and when we encounter it, and how to make Jewish choices in a way that recognizes the reality of the world that they're coming of age within, but is not defined and is not mandated by others and instead is their own choice. And I'm happy to speak more to that, but I'll, I'll wait and see if you have a different question. Gen Z will be the last generation to talk directly with Holocaust survivors. How does Gen, v view, Gen Z view the stories of their great grandparents who were killed or who survived? Does Holocaust education lead Gen Z to condemn war, condemn war, whether it's non-state or other, and to equate violence, any kind of violence with the Holocaust? 
Oh, it's a, such a good question. There are so many different layers that we can go into about the role of Holocaust education um, as it relates to modern anti-Semitism. So the first thing that I will name is absolutely yes, exactly what you said. We are at the moment where the Holocaust is going to slip from living memory into history. In many communities, perhaps in places not uh, Long Island or Westchester, that has already happened. Um, I know that I am regularly reminded of my New York privilege when I travel around the country um, talking about anti-Semitism and say that, and someone says, we haven't had a living survivor in our community for five years, 10 years, since COVID, since before COVID. Um, and it's going to be a difference in terms of reckoning with the Holocaust and what this means. On the one hand, we have really, I mean, I, I don't know if this is crass sounding, so I apologize if so. We have the most exciting technology at our fingertips. I'm regularly um, blown away by innovations in terms of what it means to preserve the legacy of the Holocaust through holograms, through AI, through VR, through all sorts of things that are being developed. But at the same time, our Gen Zers are incredibly savvy when it comes to the world of technology and of media. And in a world where everything can be faked using these same tools of AI and holograms and VR, there's this question that we then have to grapple with of how do we tell our stories without reinforcing the idea of these tools? And how do we build trust in the narrative of the Holocaust, one that so many of us we know so well and are is so deeply ingrained in us because we heard it firsthand, perhaps because we felt it firsthand. I'll say I learned about the Holocaust. I mean, I, I don't remember learning about the Holocaust because my grandma was a survivor. Um, and I learned about it probably way too young. Um, but at the same time, as I said, with all these other things, there is no right age. This is the story that I know. This is the story of my family. And it was taught to me before I had a sense of the arc of history by any means. And that's not going to be the case for many of our young people. Holocaust education is critical because we know that on the one hand, it hasn't worked in the ways that we want it to. So we need to be doing better. And it's the thing that a public school educator is the most comfortable accessing about the Jewish community. If we think about it, when there's an instance of anti-Semitism in a school, what is most often the answer that the school comes up with? We're gonna teach about the Holocaust. We're gonna read Night or the Diary of Anne Frank. We're gonna go to a Holocaust museum. Right now it was recently announced um, this, this summer, I've lost track of time here in New York, that um, there's amazing funding being given for all of the eighth graders in the uh, New York City public school system to visit the Holocaust Museum, the Museum of Jewish Heritage. Um, on the one hand, that's amazing. They need to know these stories. On the other hand, we also need to be talking about living Jews and that anti-Semitism didn't end with the Holocaust, as well as Judaism didn't end with the Holocaust. One of the most like staggeringly awkward moments that I've had this past year was a really well-meaning uh, adolescent saying to me, wait, there are still Jews? Um, I was like, yeah, we're still here. Here's one. Um, but that's horrifying and, uh, and not the amusing story that I sometimes uh, want to think of it as. Um, in terms of the legacy of the Holocaust, one of the biggest challenges that we are going to continue to encounter as a people is the univer universalization of the Holocaust. So what does that mean? For many of us, generationally, ethnically, in our Jewish kishkes, the Holocaust is different. It is other. That's not to negate or to minimize the traumas and the atrocities that any other people has suffered throughout history. They are innumerable and we do not need to be, you know, we just finished the actual Olympics. We don't need to be engaging in the oppression Olympics to say ours was worse, but we can say ours was ours and this is ours. And whether someone is a descendant of survivors or not, there is a collective memory of the Holocaust that all of us share and feel ingrained within and is informing, I mean, it informs what Jewish education looks like. I just, uh, we're participating in research right now about what it is meant to bring Jews to the sites of October 7th and how much of the imagery that we're using is that of Holocaust imagery 
or that of Holocaust education, of the importance of meeting with survivors and hearing their stories and immersing ourselves in these spaces because it works for us and it makes sense in a really visceral way. And for so many of our young people, the idea of never again, the legacy of the Holocaust is not just about Jews. It's about a universal experience of not letting this happen to other people, of making sure that from our ashes can come our allyship for others. And I'm not here to negate, by the way, like, great, amazing. We should be not wanting others to suffer what we have suffered and our young people and their righteous indignation to make sure that the world is a better place great legacies of of the Holocaust and the Holocaust education that they are receiving. But I think in so many ways, we have lost that particularism, that they don't understand why is the story, if not different, at least different to me, because it is mine, because I have a sense of ownership over it, because I need to make sure we're seeing increased Holocaust denial, we're seeing a lack of Holocaust knowledge, we know um, that so many of the tools, despite the effort that has been put into them, have not necessarily worked in the ways that we want them to. And for our young people to feel empowered to take on that legacy, that burden, that responsibility to tell those stories is a tremendous amount of work. That's so excellent. And, and that's a topic we could certainly talk uh, a lot more about. But some of this, if I may, goes back to how we're teaching our, our kids. So a question that I have, and part of this is based on, I'm on the board of George Mason Hillel. And so we've had our share of students who have protested um, and the, the students who have uh, been protesting uh, are not just uh, Muslim students, uh, many of them are not, and even some Jewish students, even some who are in Hillel have, have been there. So the question I'd like to ask on that is, what do you think is the impact of Jewish students' religious education, either at Jewish day schools or at Hebrew schools at their synagogues? And how would you compare, if I may ask, their religious education to Muslim students at their day schools or mosques? And do you see differences on how these two groups are? How do we, essentially, how are we preparing our Jewish kids in Hebrew school or in day school in this world? Um, so I'll give the disclaimer that while I can claim a fair amount of expertise on what's happening in Jewish education, I cannot claim it in terms of what is happening in um, Muslim education. So I'm going to be very broad strokes about the latter part of the question in terms of comparison, um, just from it's not for me necessarily to speak to um, the Jewish education that so many um, of our young people are receiving is beautiful. It's well-meaning. It strives to meet learners where they are and to focus on whole person centered education in wonderful ways, focuses a lot on personal meaning making. And I'm speaking largely to non-Orthodox spaces. So I'm the first one to name that as a whole separate category. Um, and in so many ways, it's not enough. We have left so much of content aside We've spent a lot of time as a community within Jewish education wanting and striving to, again, walk the talk of meeting learners where they are, which we absolutely should, and letting them figure it out for themselves, not necessarily teaching what happened in what happened in Auschwitz, what happened in 1948, what happened in 1967, what happened um, in Kishinev, what happened in like something really positive. I don't know what happened, um, you know, in the Catskills, what happened in the Borscht Belt. Um, we haven't taught the what as much as we've taught a sense of connection, a sense of why. But if that sense of connection and why feels shaky, if it feels loose, if it's not grounded in content, our learners are left not necessarily knowing what am I supposed to do with it? Um, I have a lot of students who will, will share, I know that I'm supposed to feel X. I know I'm supposed to care about being Jewish. I know I'm supposed to be excited about this. I know I'm supposed to have this feeling, but I don't know if I do, or I'm not sure like how I'm supposed to get there because I've spent X number of years with people teaching me how to have a difficult conversation, 
but they didn't tell me what I'm supposed to say in the difficult conversation. And by the way, we've seen the failures of talking points and what you're supposed to say and giving five bullet points on how to talk about Israel. And then the second the person on the quote unquote other side goes off script, you're back to, oh my goodness, I don't know what to do. So we need to be giving a content rich breadth and depth education about the Jewish story. We need to not be afraid of the Israel of it all when it comes to talking to our kids. I had a conversation with a Jewish educator a few months back who had said, I, I, I don't know how to teach this class. I'm being asked to talk about Israel and I don't know anything. What if I get it wrong? What if I don't know the answers to all of their questions? And I asked this teacher, well, what were you supposed to teach before October 7th? Like what was the actual content of this class supposed to be? This was when we were gonna talk about God. I said, so you know how to answer everyone's questions about God? Like, you know what if someone asked a question that you didn't know the answer to about God? That's something that you feel confident about? I like mazel because I, I have no idea how you're supposed to talk to kids about God in a way that there's a right and a wrong answer. Um, but Israel somehow is the one that feels intimidating. Oh, interesting. And yet, that's true. Israel is intimidating in so many ways for educators because Israel is being seen as the pass fail barometer of a Jewish education. If someone comes out of a Jewish educational environment and has learned that a Shabbat practice looks like singing songs and lighting candles and having a shared meal and says, well, you know what? That's great. But my personal Shabbat feeling comes from a meditative solo experience, the answer for that person's Jewish educator is going to be amazing. I wish you only luck on your Jewish journey that has led you to a different place than mine, but like, great. I hope you have your great meditative experience. But if the answer to, I've heard everything you have to say about Israel, but my answer is I'm going to be the kid blowing the shofar at the encampment. You're a failure. I, as the educator, I'm a failure. Um, this is horrible. This is bad for the Jewish people. And I'm only saying that again, a little bit facetiously. I actually think that like juxtaposition really, really makes sense in so many different, uh, different ways in different environments. We can't shy away from the hard questions with our students when they are in Jewish spaces because they're going to get answers elsewhere. And the answer cannot be that the Jewish education that they received wasn't ready to deal with their angst, to deal with their feelings, to deal with their questions. I, there is not a single question that someone could ask about Israel that we should be scared to answer because we have really great answers. And because our tradition is that of grappling and wrestling and hugging and loving and dissent, and somehow we have to get back to that. We need to remember that in so many ways, a typical Jewish education, um, especially in a part-time Jewish educational environment, has unfortunately infantilized learners in ways that we don't actually have to. And many educational institutions are pushing back against this. We need to know where kids are developmentally and meet them there and push them there. If in their public school or their whatever their day learning environment is they're somehow able to grapple with complex questions about history and identity and meaning making. They shouldn't go to a Jewish learning environment and be coloring in a worksheet. We're ready to, we need to be ready to have the same level of conversation and to not have it be um, the phone call, you know, two weeks before someone goes to college, you need to give them a crash course. So that way, by the time they get to campus, they know how to answer all the questions. This needs to start early. It needs to be open. It needs to be complex. It needs to not, again, be nuanced and not shy away from being able to ask and answer any hard question within the loving embrace of the Jewish community. I think that's an excellent answer. And uh, the reason I'd ask that question was in my observance uh, at Mason Hillel and what I gather from our students who tend to be shy, they don't really want to go out there when the demonstration there, that those other kids who are demonstrating seem to be much more prepared and more confident about what they're going to say. And I I'm think in many ways, we as a Jewish community, um, collectively, we recognize the breadth of our tent and we don't want to exclude anyone. So we, we don't give 
hard and fast. Here's your slogan. Here is your equivalent of from the river to the sea, because we, as I said, we love nuance. Anyone who's ever opened a page of Talmud, and I studied Dafyomi, can say, here's a yes or no question. And somehow 27 pages later, we're still figuring out all of the different potential feelings about it. We really struggle with hard and fast. We love complexity. We love being able to say, well, kind of this, and if someone believes this and nuance on this. And in so many ways, that's beautiful because that is who we are. We welcome dissent and we have room within our tent for so many different voices. And you're totally right. When it comes to an organizing perspective to say, we need a slogan, that's not where we shine. Well, that I wish we could go on that one. That's That raises some questions, but with the time going, there's one more question, sort of uh, to me, the 800 uh, pound gorilla uh, that's in the room and, and I don't think you've have brought it up um, as yet. So the question I'd like uh, here is, so can you explain the impact of social media on Z, Gen Z? Is TikTok particularly threatening to Jewish students? There are purported neo-Nazi networks on TikTok. I don't do TikTok, so I don't know. Um, using AI generated media with millions of views. There are videos, I'm told, that say, actually it was in your book that was said, that Hitler was right. So what is Gen Z's perspective on this? How is social media uh, shaping them? And what do we as parents, grandparents, aunts or uncles uh, can do? Fine. So social media um, is the language through which Generation Z and uh, much of Generation Alpha sp uh, speak the most fluently. Um, they have come of age with it. And it's only now for our youngest students that I think many of us are realizing the impact. Highly recommend uh, Jonathan Haidt's newest book um, to explore really what we're talking about when it comes to the impact that social media and personal devices in particular are having on young people. And there's tremendous pushback now with movements within schools to say, we're going to wait until high school to give personal devices. Um, we're going to wait to let our kids on social media. There's no reason for people to be on this early. And yet, Gen Zers, big adult, collectively are on social media. And if someone's going to say, oh, I know this one person who isn't, good for them. They're all on social media. Um, so when it comes to what that means, number of different things. First of all, when it comes to an experience of anti-Semitism, it is inescapable. Why is it inescapable? Because no, none of the young people in our lives have good social media habits and none of us have good phone habits anymore. I'm the first one to say, I go to sleep. My phone is literally right here. Um, and I justify it by saying, you know, I have, I have a sister in Israel. I have a brother um, in Virginia. Like I, my phone, I'm a mom. My phone is literally never off because in case someone needs me now, this year, have there been moments where like, there's been someone who needs me? Yes. But other than this year, what does that really mean? It means that when I roll over in the middle of the night, I'm looking at Instagram. Um, and that blue light is the first thing that I get to see. It's really easy to say about a young person with social media. That's not re like, that's not your real life. It's not like someone said something to you in person. It's more real than anything else because it doesn't go away. When I was in middle school or high school, when any of us were in middle school or high school, if someone bullied you, if someone was mean to you, you got to leave. You went home. Perhaps you went to whatever else. I mean, in my case, I went to my youth movement. I went to USY. I was a totally different person in USY than I was in my public high school. And between a Friday afternoon and a Monday morning, if everyone else in my class was at a party that I didn't know about, I literally had no idea. Um, it's glorious. Ignorance is bliss in so many spaces. Now, if someone isn't invited to something, it's unfolding in real time and they're watching it happen and they don't have the developmental, um, uh, stage having been met in their brain to remember that anyone else's social media profile is the highlight of the best of what they want to portray of themselves. And just like yours, you don't want it to be like, today I didn't do anything. Nobody's posting that. So everyone's day looks better than yours, even though yours looks just as good to the outside world. In turn, So that's general social media. It's rough. In terms of um, what it means in terms of anti-Semitism, there's tremendous anti-Semitism happening on social media. For many Jews, they are choosing to bifurcate their identities. So there's research coming out about the Jewish teens who go on organized high school trips to Israel. So like those most engaged and connected kids. 
and how many of them have set up separate Instagram and TikTok accounts to document their Jewish selves because they're saying, I, like, I don't want the rest of my feed to be clogged up with anti-Semitism. So here's where I'm going to put everything else about who I am, my friends and my sports and my hobbies and school. And here's going to be my Jewish one. And I know that that's just where all the bashing is going to happen. And we don't want that. We don't want them th to see this is my real life and this is my Jewish closeted self. We want it to be, this is a core part of who I am. Um, we have seen the weaponization of social media, particularly uh, this past year. Many of us remember in the immediate days post-October 7th, there was a lot of grappling amongst parents and amongst educators. Should I be taking my kid's phone away? because the videos are about to come out from Hamas of all of the atrocities of October 7th. And um, Sivan Zakai, who's a noted um, expert in Israel education for young people, particularly elementary school age learners, said something that I, I've been holding since then, um, which was, you can't close their eyes, but you don't have to let them see. So we can't close our kids' eyes to what is happening in the world. Their news is coming via social media. We're not taking it away from a teen or a 20-something who already has it and who is embedded into this world and who finds meaning and community and connection through it. And we can't just be caught in this and let them be caught in this endless cycle of doom scrolling. They need to be able to look up, to take a break, to look at what exactly am I seeing? Who is this from? Is this reputable? What is that being shared? Did that really happen? There was a meme going around a few weeks ago um, that was actually, I think, mostly pulled from the internet that basically showed the Gaza Strip, it said, on October 6th and on October 10th. On October 6th, all lit up at night, this like heat map thing, and on October 10th, allegedly totally dark. Not a single Israeli soldier was in Gaza by October 10th. Nothing had happened in Gaza yet. There was still fighting in Kibbutz Be'eri at that point. There were still um, members of Hamas inside Israel. But for someone to see without that context, a Jewish student to see, oh my God, how did we, you know, th this is terrible. We, we made Gaza go dark and these poor people um, without the context to recognize this actually didn't happen it's the easiest thing in the world to get your news from social media and to believe it. So we need to make sure that they have the tools, they have the knowledge, and that we're not shying away from these spaces because they are there, but we're approaching them in a really thoughtful way. I appreciate that a great deal. That topic also could just go on. Um, while we're at a time limit, there was one really good question. So if I could ask this question of you and with a short response, uh, since we're no already promises. at the clock. But it really seems to be a uh, excellent one uh, question, which is, are we losing Gen Z and Alpha? No. <laughs> um, okay. That was my short answer. Um, I do not think we are losing Gen Z and, Gen and Alpha. I think that we do need to double down on what it means to connect with the needs of these generations and to understand what they are up against when it comes to a world where to be Jewish is essentially to be countercultural, um, to be against the grain for so many of their friends when it comes to support of Israel, when it comes to being different, being other, how one shows up politically, how one shows up within the world. Um, we are not losing them. They, again, largely, they love being Jewish, but we need to give them a why for it. We need to make that love and that positive association into a sustainable one. Um, and we need to access all of the tools. Again, there's more opportunity to be and to do Jewish than ever before. We need to help them reach all of those news and ways and connection points so that they're not lost and to recognize that the way that Jewish looks for them, the way that doing and being Jewish shows up um, is not how perhaps it looked like what success meant for a previous generation, for mine, for yours. Uh, but it doesn't make it less real. That's a great answer. I think it's a very positive answer. Uh, Samantha, thank you so much. Thank really you. Really appreciated your time. And uh, for everyone who's more interested in this topic, we will have future webinars. And uh, please do, uh, don't hesitate to contact uh, the committee, suggest some topics uh, to us. 
So we can do that. And one of those will be uh, workshops that we've developed, as I mentioned earlier, where we can um, uh, teach how, how families should think about their Gen Z kids in different environments. We formatted it using the HNB approach. So if uh, any of your clubs or regions would like to do that, uh, our committee would be very happy to share the model that we have tested and went very well at the Seaboard Retreat at the end of June. Samantha and everybody, thank you so much for being here. Have a wonderful uh, rest of the, the week and uh, everyone be well and take care. Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of your night.